Hello, folks, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Linda Bilsons Brolis of the Institute for Local Self Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Also joining me is our communications fellow, Jordan Ashby, who will be helping keep the webinar running smoothly. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, so in this webinar, our esteemed panel will dive into the quickly evolving challenges of jumping worms, why it's an issue that deserves our immediate attention, opportunities for contributing to solutions, and practical steps uh, that can be taken from the individual level up to the commercial. Uh, for those of you who noticed that all of our presenters are based in Vermont, uh, this webinar was directly inspired by a session at the Vermont Organics Recycling Summit earlier this year, which was a fabulous and super informative event, and it's something that everyone should keep tabs on. So before we dive into today's topic, a quick overview of ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative, um, which is advancing composting to reduce waste, regenerate local soils, create community development opportunities, and protect the climate. Uh, we work to catalyze distributed locally based composting options that include home, community, and on-farm systems. Uh, we provide a variety of technical support to the community composting movement and have a wealth of resources on our website, which you should check out at your leisure. Uh, but this week, we have a couple of home composting workshops uh, coming up, one in Spanish on Friday and one in English on Saturday. And Jordan will add the link in the chat for this opportunity um, for you to learn more and register. Uh, and we also have a fall promotion for our Community Composting 101 online certificate course. Uh, enrollment is free for anyone in the Mid-Atlantic or Northeast regions, but anyone can request a scholarship regardless of where they're located. And bulk discounts are also available. Um, and again, check out the link in the chat to learn more. <clears throat> this webinar, uh, which is part of a series, is being brought to you through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge. Healthy soils practices like the skillful production and use of compost on farms can improve farm resilience and profitability while also providing critical ecosystem services. You can learn more about this project at millionacrechallenge.org. And as I mentioned, uh, this is, webinar is part of a series. Uh, you can access the recordings for all the webinars in the series on our website. Um, we also posted one a few weeks ago on composting and the FDA produce safety rule. So, we can, so you can find the recording for that as well. Awesome. So now we're going to get to know each other a little bit better uh, with some interactive polls. So, um, and you can find this, you can participate by um, answering in your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. So the first question, what best describes your affiliation? Uh, you can select the best option, though I think I also made it so you could select multiple. Um, are you a composter? Are you a farm service, a farmer or a farm service provider? Are you a researcher? Are you associated with a government entity? Or are you associated with a nonprofit? Alrighty, I give it a couple more seconds. Okay, let's check out the results. Alrighty, vast majority identify as composters. That's fabulous. We've got a good mix of other folks participating. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Okay, the next question. Okay, where are you participating from? Select one of the following. Eastern US, Southern US, Western US, Midwestern US, or outside of the US. It's always fun to see who's part participating from outside of the US. Though time zones can be an issue. All right, I'm gonna close the poll. Okay, as uh, is often with our webinars, often the case with our webinars, a lot from the Eastern US, um, but a good showing from the Midwest as well, um, and even maybe one person from outside of the US. So welcome to you all. Okay, and final question for now. <clears throat> to the best of your knowledge, have you encountered jumping worms? Options are yes, no, or I don't know, and it's okay to not know. 
That's why we're here. Okay, closing the poll. Okay, more than half of you already think or know that you've already encountered jumping worms. That's pretty staggering. Um, and a few of you say no, some of you don't know. All right, we're gonna ask this question again at the end of the session um, to see if the information changes your mind of whether you think you've encountered um, jumping worms. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna hand things over to our first presenter. Um, and as Jordan's doing that, we're going to, I just wanted to share a few housekeeping notes. Um, everyone is in listen only mode. Uh, we will have plenty of time at the end of each presentation. We'll leave a little bit of time between each presentation to ask a couple of questions. And we will also um, aim to have time at the end for more questions. Um, and you can enter your questions as they come up into the GoToWebinar control panel that should be on your screen. And again, this webinar is being recorded and everyone will automatically be sent a copy of it uh, tomorrow, uh, sometime, midday tomorrow, it's basically 24 hours after the webinar ends. And so now to introduce Joseph. Joseph Gores is an assistant professor of plant and soil science at the University of Vermont and has been studying the effects of jumping worms on Vermont's agriculture and forests and how to control them since 2019. He's currently in Canada, studying the early stages of a jumping worm invasion. So without further ado, Joseph, take us away. Hi, everybody. Um, greetings, greetings from Canada. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can see my, my presentation screen. We um, can. You could, if you put yourself into presentation mode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Down at the bottom there, yes. Maybe. Yes, uh, but go back. I think we're on slide now, nine now. Oh yeah, what is that? Preview, quick preview. No worries. Looks good. That's not the right presentation. Hang on a second. I know something would go wrong. There you go. Um, that's better. All right, so uh, for those of, you, those of you who haven't, we're back to, this is annoying. I can't see, I can't see my presentation. Um, hang on a second. If you need to go back to a previous view, um, if that's better, go for it. That's not it. You know, I, people, can you guys see see my presentation even though it's not in presentation mode? Because when I go to presentation mode, it just kicks me back into. Yes, um, we can see kind of all of your slides on the left hand side, but um, I think the the centers uh, of the screen is focused on your main slide. Okay, and we'll just go with that because I don't want to waste time. Um, so, uh, for those of you who haven't seen jumping worms before, or you think you haven't seen them, just give me, give you, uh, let me give you a few uh, pointers of how to um, how to identify them. So, the picture that you see there is of a jumping worm, Amynthus agrestis, one of the three big ones in in uh, New England. Um, and uh, the way to identify them when they're adults is by this ring around the collar, and in comparison to all the other earthworms that you might encounter, this ring goes all the way around the body. So it will look on the top very similar to what it looks like on the bottom of the worm. Um, this ring is usually offset from in, ter in terms of color from the rest of the body very clearly. In this case, it's a, a lighter color, but it can also be all the way to a pink color, uh, but it would still be very different from the rest of the, of the body. The other thing that you see in here um, are, are the castings of these earthworms, the excrements, the frass of these, these earthworms. They're very globular, they're very loose. Uh, you can move them around very easily. Uh, and for that reason, they may also be highly erodible, which is one of the things that we should have to worry about. Uh, of course, the other way to identify them is that they, uh, that they are very active and they tend to uh, wiggle in your, in your hand. Um, and, and they move like snakes on the ground. 
So those are the things, also known as snake worms. Jumping worm is the preferred term for them now. So the phenology Joseph, of uh, these... Joseph, yes. sorry to interrupt. Could you possibly uh, X out of the format background uh, oh, yeah, box sure. that's on the side? Thank you. Bye there. Oh, now I'm back seeing myself. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, anyway, so what you see there, I'm just going to make it up as I go along. I, I can't see my screen at all. Um, uh, I don't know why that is. Um, anyway, so what you see there, uh, hopefully, is is a, a bunch of graphs that show the uh, basically the abundance of these earthworms through time. Um, through, through the year. These ones are annual, so they they hatch from cocoons sometime in April, and they all are kind of dead by the end of uh, by the end of November. Even though this year, when we had really warm uh, winter, they lasted and some of them, very few of them, lasted until January. Um, so a couple of the the really important life events uh, here is that uh, they um, uh, they hatch around April beginning of April, uh, they then increase in number, so as juveniles, uh, until about mid-June, beginning of, beginning of May. And then uh, there's a, it's a crash in the population as they are advancing towards adult, um, adulthood, uh, reproductive maturity, that could happen any time between um, uh, July and August. And at that point, they, uh, they will they will develop that ring around the collar that I was talking about. That's when you can positively identify them. Um, so that'll be, as I said, Ju July to, to August. Um, and that crash might have to do with uh, just that they have eaten themselves out of, uh, out of food. Um, and then the, the uh, population stays stable uh, when the first frost occurs towards the end of August in some places like the Adirondacks. Um, uh, or in, in September, uh, there's another crash, uh, and then uh, there's a slow decline of these, these uh, organisms uh, towards the end of November, when most of the time you lose them all. Um, as I said, that they, they survive as, um, they survive as, uh, as cocoons during the wintertime. I'm not sure whether I can advance the slides when I don't see them. <laughs> So I don't know. It's really weird. Um, um, we could try taking over controls for you. Yeah, if that would be take preferable. over the control because I have no idea why this is not working. Jordan, are you able to pull up his presentation? Yeah, give me one second. And then it'd be really nice if I could see it too. <laughs> There you go. Just advance to uh, the third slide, please, and then uh, go into presentation mode. That'd be great. And you can get into presentation mode. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. you yes, yeah, so is that? Can you see? And I'll put it slide. on the third slide. That looks yeah. great. Apologies, my computer is now freezing. Not ideal. There. Okay. There you go. Um, so the cocoons are survival structures, and uh, unfortunately, also build up. So cocoons that don't hatch in one year, they build up into a cocoon bank, which is a really big problem if you want to to uh, control these worms. On the left hand side, you see what happens to the cocoons during a drought in the summer or during very cold temperatures in the winter time. The cocoons dehydrate. And that dehydration is the way uh, that they um, that they protect their embryos that are developing inside. Once they're dehydrated, the embryos stop developing. And then as as warmer or moister uh, temperatures and moister soils uh, occur, they rehydrate and the the um, the embryos start to develop again. Uh, so 
th these are these are the really problematic uh, structures for controlling them. So, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, there are three big 21st century planetary planetary crises, as you know, about climate change, biodiversity, and, and, and local and global extinctions, uh, and then there's land degradation. And uh, so the earthworms are not the major causes of them, but they, they will definitely uh, contribute. So um, this emission, they increase the emissions of climate change gases, they reduce the carbon storage in, in the soil of, of forests, uh, they also lead to environmental degradation that can also uh, affect climate change. Then there's the biodiversity issue. Uh, invasive species in general are uh, responsible for local extinctions, and so are these, these earthworms. Um, and then land degradation, uh, we think that the very loose castings of these earthworms are highly erodible. Uh, so if you're on a slope, uh, if your land is on a slope and you have these worms and you have a casting layer, uh, you will lose some of that soil. Uh, and of course, even though these are, these are planetary crises, uh, these crises are felt locally in your garden, your nursery, your forest, your compost pile. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is how earth invasions affect uh, the environment. Um, so once there's an invasion, uh, soil structure, uh, the density of the soil and the organic horizon are all changed. In fact, the organic horizon is being consumed and, and basically destroyed. And that has effects on the soil fertility, on the temperature of the soil and the moisture of the, and the, moisture of the soil. And that leads to alterations in, in microbial processes, so the rates at which uh, nutrients are being released from the soil and so on. Uh, and all of that uh, then uh, leads to changes in plant community composition. Uh, and that is basically changes the habitat for some vertebrate species. And all of that together will have effects on such things as uh, other invasive species coming in, um, plant community composition already mentioned, wildlife habitat, um, forest and crop productivity, uh, and then what we don't know all that much about yet is you know, how that affects uh, uh, water quality. Uh, earthworms are still part of the soil quality um, index of the USDA, and they shouldn't really be there anymore, but they are. And then there's climate change, of course, and, and you know, if you're really worried about disease, then there's also effects on, on human human disease and uh, plant and animal diseases. The next slide, please. So it all starts with soil modification. And so just to give you an idea of what that might look like, um, so a typical soil in a northeastern US forest and into Canada would have a really thick organic layer. And that is that really spongy layer on, on top of soils that you might might encounter when you when you're hiking in uh, at elevations in Vermont. There's still there are still some places that are not invaded by earthworms. It's very spongy. That's where the roots are. The roots of trees are. That's where a lot of the mycorrhizae and other fungi live. And it's a very, very biologically uh, valuable uh, part of the soil. That's where, as I said, the roots and mycorrhizae are, and that's where a lot of the decomposition occurs. Uh, and therefore, you know, plants get some of the nutrition there, forest plants in particular. Um, when you have European earthworm invasions, and so by the way, those are also destructive in forests, uh, you get a, a that's, that's the uh, picture on the bottom right hand corner of the slide. You get a, you, you notice that that layer is being, uh, being consumed and being some of it being uh, mixed in with the rest of the soil, making making a mineral soil uh, that's no longer as valuable for the for the forest plants as as the organic layer. Uh, for the uh, jumping worms, that's the image on the top there. Uh, they make sometimes thick layers of uh, of castings, and they're granular. Um, they might be five to 10 centimeters deep. Sometimes you don't find any, but you find, find the orphans. That's usually the case in areas that are on a slope where the castings have been washed away. Uh, next slide, please. 
And so that's the upshot of it all. So, you know, on, on the left-hand side, you see an image of a forest on camel sump uh, that's not invaded by earthworms. And then on the right-hand side, you see an image of, uh, of a site in the Champlain Valley that is invaded by um, jumping worms. So the big difference is you know, the, the lack of an understory, um, really important uh, uh, piece to remember. There is, a, there is an effect on not just the organic layer, so climate change issue, uh, but also on the abundance and diversity of plants in the understory of these trees, of these forests. Next slide, please. So here's an email I got just today. Uh, I live in X town with a large sugar bush in the forest behind my homes, including ours uh, on Exley Road. Uh, it came to my attention uh, last night that our conservation commission meeting at our conservation commission meeting that jumping worms are in the compost of someone on our road. I, I'm wondering if you or your students might be able to give us some help eradicating these worms. Conservation Commission would also like to uh, have information about this issue at X Town Community Harvest Day. Uh, sugaring, here comes the important part. Sugaring is a vital part of the agricultural life of X Town. We all want to save our sugar maples. So any help you can give us, blah, blah, blah. So uh, here's a potential conflict, right? So how did how do these worms get, get into these yards? Uh, and what kind of impact would they have on sugar bush, right? So there's there's that horticultural side of things. That's usually how they move around horticulture. Uh, and uh, then there's the other industry, sugaring. Uh, and those those could potentially be in conflict with each other because you know one creates a problem for the other. Just something to consider. Um, and there's the, there's the compost statement. Compost piles are really good for for these uh, things, especially the ones that are not reaching sufficient uh, temperatures to kill cocoons and um, and worms. Next slide, please. So climate change, uh, the northern the northern hardwood forest stretches from uh, Nova Scotia, where I'm where I'm at right now, all the way to Wisconsin and then down down the Appalachian uh, spine a little bit. Uh, so it's a big area. Uh, and if you if you add the boreal forest to it, then um, these two ecosystems uh, have as much carbon stored in them as is in the atmosphere right now. So that's really important. Uh, if, you, if you are losing that organic layer, you're losing a lot of that carbon. Next slide, please. And then it's the global biodiversity crisis. Uh, this, we're talking about the sixth mass extinction, extinction event and earthworms basically affect plant biodiversity uh, they've also been shown to affect invertebrate di diversity in, in, in soils. Um, some vertebrates are, are also in affected, so those are, tend to be ground nesting birds like the oven bird, uh, as an example, uh, and some of the salamanders are affected. And so I'm, I'm saying this uh, from the context of the northern forest, that's where, where the University of Vermont is. Uh, it's not necessarily true in areas where these earthworms are, um, are native. And uh, not all impacts are known on, on, on biodiversity. Uh, next slide, please. So what can be done? So what we need are, are tools. So we need maybe a land ethic. Everybody is responsible, responsible for some of the degradations that are caused by human action. And that includes people with earthworms, right? So we have to think about uh, what we can do to, to reduce that. So maybe there should be something like a con um, an advanced form of the countryside road a code that is in the in the UK uh, where visitors to natural areas are responsible for for uh, for keeping those safe uh, hot, we have to develop more horticultural best practices best composting practices best gardening practices we have to look at pesticides that might be useful for uh, for controlling these worms in garden and maybe horticultural settings uh, we have to develop trust in institutions and science, which is highly eroded. So people can kind of say, well, we don't care really, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and uh, the one thing that, that I do know what we're talking about is that there's really no pesticides that are certified for, for uh, earthworms at this point in the United States. And that's sad, but there's also hope. So next slide, please. So for composters, um, 
I think I have I have these uh, recommendations, and they're they're probably totally and utterly uh, common sense to you already. But check the supply chain for worms. Check that the compost that the compost uh, also check that the compost that your compost is not invaded at nurseries where they sell them in in bulk. That might be a problem. But some nurseries have these worms frequently. And uh, so if, if they store their compost there, uh, there might be invasion at the nursery. Uh, be selective of what you take as feedstock. Uh, so a lot of yard wastes are invaded. Um, so make checking for jumping worms uh, part of your quality control. Uh, check that any vermicides you may use don't affect plant growth. Uh, the the word on the street is that there are no EPA sanctioned vermicides right now. Nothing is certified. Uh, and then investigate uh, reports about jumping worms in your compost. Don't just say, well, it's not us. Just check check it out. Where, follow, follow that supply chain. Where, where do those come from? Do they come actually from, from, from your facility or they come from somewhere else? Um, you should know that jumping worms can't tolerate temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit. Uh, make sure your compost windrows gets get get hot enough. Um, static, personally, I think static aerated piles might be better because they have a more uniform heat profile. Um, and then one thing I think is important that uh, if you do everything right in your composting, you shouldn't have any any cocoons or worms in them. Uh, but you have to defend your cooling down area. So the maturing compost is probably the uh, the most likely place where these uh, jumping worms are invading. Next slide, please. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, that one, thank you. Uh, so there, there are some pesticides that, that work against jumping worms. So there, there are some old fashioned ones that are banned for good reason because they have, have arsenic and, and mercury and other such things in, in them, so they're banned. Um, they were used uh, up to the 70s on, on golf courses, um, but uh, there are other substances now that, that work that are probably not as bad. So to start with the uh, entomopathogenic fungi, so fungi that kill, that kill insects, and under, with various formulations uh, that uh, they, they can be effective. And on, on the graph that I'm showing, uh, the formulation is that the Bovaria bassiana, that, that fungus that kills, kills uh, insects, uh, was grown on millet. And that millet was then applied to uh, pots in, in a greenhouse. And so what you see there on, in the graph is basically a comparison between the mortality rates on adult jumping worms uh, given three different uh, three different um, agents, so Bovaria bassiana, that that fungus, uh, reached something like sixty percent mortality. Um, uh, soap, about the same, and then vinegar is really really good at killing killing these jumping worms. However, uh, with Bovaria bassiana, the plants were unharmed. With soap. Uh, plant growth slowed, so there were two or three weeks behind all the other plants that, that didn't receive any, any agents. And then with vinegar, all the plants died. So uh, don't use vinegar to start. So soaps and detergents are, might be a good alternative. Some soaps are uh, actually on, uh, uh, on a list of low risk uh, detergents, uh, low, low, low risk uh, pesticides um, that the EPA has, and more about that in a minute. And then there's saponins like tea tree extract works really well. Uh, it used to be part of a fertilizer, um, but it's that's now um, banned for use on. Or it's not being produced anymore. Should put that with that way. That fertilizer is not produced anymore. But you can buy tea tree uh, pellets, tea tree uh, meal pellets, um, uh, and that seems to be very effective. There's maurer meal uh, that works, but it's no longer available. It, it stopped being used sometime in, in the 90s of last the last millennium. Uh, and then there's some other plant meals. All plants have saponins in them. Uh, so anything that has a really high amount of saponin in it might be a, a candidate for this. But we need, we need to do tests to prove that. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, even though there's nothing that's certified against earthworms right now, uh, there's ways to get exemptions for use against earthworms. So things to consider is a that there is a law, right? There's a law that that rules pesticides, and here in the in the states it would be the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act (FIFRA), and in Canada the corresponding corresponding law is called Pest Control Products Act. Uh, they're enacted by EPA or by the Canada, by Canada Health in Canada. These regulate pesticide certification and use, and that's really important. The regulation is basically on the pesticide label, right? So you have to follow the label when you when you apply it. The label is the law, right? So the label is, is what you are allowed to do. Um, the label will have some things like concentration of active ingredient on it, when and how, when and how often to apply it, where to apply it, which pests, which plants. Okay, so which pest is the problem, right? So which pest is is not including it's not including earthworms. So next slide, please. So uh, there are several bases for exemptions. So there's first of all a list of minimum risk exempt ingredients under the under FIFRA. Uh, I don't know whether there's something like that for uh, for the Canadian standard. Um, and uh, the list can be found at this site. So the uh, this will be posted, so you can click on that and and go and have a look what what those are. Um, and then uh, there's also another section of FIFRA, uh, section two double E, um, uh, and that that basically says you you can get a certification. You can ask. You can request that something is certified for earthworms. Uh, if it is already certified as a pesticide for something else. But you have to, in either case, you have to go to your, your state. The, state in, the states are responsible for um, taking the EPA uh, recommendations and, and, and allowing you or not allowing you to, uh, they have to give you, they have to give you uh, permission to use these under some kind of emergency certification. So, but look at these two things. If you are really interested in having a, having something to apply to this problem, uh, look at these two uh, statutes and um, contact either the Department of Ag or the Department of Environmental Management or whatever that is called in your state, and see whether they can give whether they can come up with a um, with an exemption or or a, a, a emergency certification. Next slide, please. So why isn't there more, more research? So first of all, the, these worms only have one life cycle per year. So you, you can't really repeat something over and over again uh, in, in a year. Uh, so the research on both the, the worm and cocoon have to be, have to be done um, and they have to be replicated uh, several times over multiple years. And then the other big thing is the lack of, of funding from large funding agencies. People just don't take this very seriously, even though it's a serious problem. Having said that, there's many serious problems. So we are com competing with serious problems other, that are equally serious. So I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm the only one who has a problem. There's many other problems. And so uh, most of our funding, so 95% of our funding comes from private funders. Uh, and uh, and the Vermont Agency of Ag, who also gave us uh, uh, three years ago, gave us a, a, a grant that accounts for about five percent of of the work that we have been done been doing. Uh, and with that, I yield control back to whoever is in charge. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you, Joseph. So we do have a few uh, clarifying questions. Some of the questions that have to do with the composting process um, and managing jumping worms, I'm going to leave for after um, Dan and Natasha present. But some of the questions that we got during your presentation, Joseph, was, had to do with really, I think, nailing down how to distinguish between, you know, uh, night crawlers or other earthworms and jumping worms. Specifically, one asks about don't most worms wiggle? And somebody asked. Um, yeah. 
yeah. Uh, the, excellent. The excellent. Snake, so if you go back to the first slide, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I try to make this uh, maybe a little clearer than in the beginning when I was all kind of flustered because of, I couldn't figure this out. Um, anyway, so uh, if you look at that, at that clitellum, that's that band around the around the collar there, that um, it's really, really well offset in color from the rest of the body. That's your first thing. You're not going to see that until July, August. Okay, so that's that's a that's a problem. Um, when they're juveniles, they also uh, they they are already showing some of the the uh, behaviors of the adults. They're not going to move very far, so you don't see the snake-like uh, propulsion. Uh, but what you will what you will notice when you put them in your hand, they really just flip flip around in your hand really fast. There's only there's only one other worm that is almost as fast flipping as as the jumping worms, and that's the red wiggler. But the red wiggler looks very different. So here's here's what the what to look for. Uh, on any kind of small worm that is that is uh, flipping around, look for a yellow tail. If it's if it has a yellow tail, it's not a jumping worm. Then you have a red wiggler. If it has, when when the worm stretches and it has stripes, then it's not a jumping worm. Then it's a red wiggler. So the jumping worm is is known. So the red wiggler is known as yellow tail or tiger worm as well. So those two things give give away that red wiggler. For jumping worms, you don't see that. It's a relatively uniform color, uh, and it just really flips out on your on your uh, in your hand. That's why they're called jumping worms because they appear to be jumping out of your your hand, but they're not really jumping. They're just really, really uh, flipping really quickly. Wonderful. Thanks for that clarification. Um, and uh, I guess some of the questions that have come, there's a lot of questions for you, so I'm only gonna get to a couple more now, um, and then we'll save the rest for the end, um, or we may have to follow up with you. Um, but mm -hmm. can someone asked if you could speak to the risk of jumping worms being spread through commercial worm castings? Uh, so jumping worms are not good composting worms, so it's highly unlikely, highly unlikely that the worm castings that are being produced uh, that you can buy commercially are um, have have cocoons in them that are jumping worm cocoons. Um, there are some some places that produce cocoon, that produce um, commercially co produce castings or, or vermicompost, and they have maybe one percent, probably even less than that. Uh, um contamination of earthworm species in them and they're not all jumping worms so uh there's a with worm vermicompost there is a slight chance that you can transmit them but i don't think it's a huge risk at all awesome. as long That's... as as long as people know that they're dealing with that dealing that what kind of worms they need for for vermicomposting and most people that do that commercially know that know the worms they, they can they can use. That's reassuring. So thank you for that clarification. And then the last question that I'm going to ask right now um, before we pass it over to our next presenter, um, sort of twofold. The um, the impacts on the environment that you were presenting earlier, was that specific to that was specific to the jumping worm, not earthworms more broadly, correct? Uh, no, <laughs> it it is it is true for jumping worms as well as for other invasive earthworms. So there are very very few, maybe 0.01 percent of native earthworms in the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, and uh, if you're walking through a, a forest in the Champlain Valley, so that's where Burlington is, where where my university is, you will see. Ex it's very similar symptoms of the to the understory of of the uh, uh, of of the forest, right? You don't see you don't you don't see a diverse understory, nor do you find a very uh, thick understory. Um, so I I what you don't see, yeah, that's great. One what you yeah what you don't see 
are that those loose castings. The European earthworms, just the, the first wave of invaders, earthworm invaders into New England, uh, have much more uh, cohesive castings. They stick together, whereas the the castings of these the uh, jumping worms do not. They are very loose, and so they can cause all sorts of havoc uh, in terms of um, erosion and the uh, and the thermal, so the, the heat properties of the soil. There's a whole bunch of different things that occur because those castings are so loose. Uh, yeah, but otherwise, I think the 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 uh, uh, if anything, uh, we have more information on the environmental impact uh, of uh, of the regular earthworms in inverted commas than we do have for jumping worms. Because jumping worms are relatively new uh, in in our woodlands, so maybe you're talking about 15 years worth of of research on on the impacts. Uh, actually, probably much less, maybe 10 years, 12 years of impact research. Um, whereas for the other for for the other European for the European earthworms, there's a much longer history of of uh, research. Well, that's a sobering perspective. Uh, thank you um, for laying that out for us. And uh, at this point, I'm going to pause questions um, so that we can hand things over uh, to our next presenter. Um, so. Uh, Dan uh, Goosen is Green Mountain Compost's Director of Composting at the Chittenden Solid Waste District. Um, that, he started there in 2003, but has man been managing compost there since 2008. Um, and he's been developing best practices for avoiding and managing jumping worms at composting facilities. So without further ado, do, uh, Dan, take it away. Great. Let me know, can you see my screen? My what? No, it look we can see uh, a browser trying to connect to GoToWebinar. Okay. There you go. All good? We can see it, yes, it looks good. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you to ILSR for having yet another great uh, topic in your webinars and for Joseph for giving us all that background. Um, and everybody in attendance. Um, seems like we have a good number of folks, and I, hopefully that means that you are all paying attention. Unfortunately, you know, it'd be nice if we were 10 years prior, 15 years prior, at least for us in Vermont, uh, with this much um, attention. It seems like the last two, three years, the number of people paying attention, at least in our region, has dramatically increased, and uh, so we appreciate uh that that trend is continuing we'll see if it is enough attention in time to do um much about it but uh i'm hoping to share with you our scenario and, and what uh, our experience has been composting in vermont uh and what we've done what we've been thinking about how to do that um in this time of jumping worms um and specifically best management practices that we've put in place that may or may not be applicable to where you are, um, either as a composter or as a consumer of compost, which hopefully you all are. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting because in Vermont, Joseph, thanks to Joseph, we've been hearing a bit about these for a long time. I think the first time I heard Joseph present on jumping worms was over a decade ago. Um, and yet, they've been around for quite a while in other parts of the country, uh, and people have been more aware of them. And we're still at the early stages of invasion, perhaps, here in Vermont. And so we're trying to figure out our biggest question, perhaps, is uh, is it too late, or does it make sense to try to slow them down? And we, we think and we hope the answer is yes. Um, but it's all it's a it's a question that keeps coming up for us because it is when you really start finding out where they are and how they are moving around it becomes pretty overwhelming pretty quickly um and just one point to joseph's presentation if anybody is still wondering about identification i think i recommend that you google uh jumping worm video or go to youtube and look for a jumping worm video because they're there it's quite impressive how how they move their bodies um, compared to other earthworms and uh, so if you, there's a lot, a lot of people struggle with the identification and just seeing how they move as adults um, is quite telling. So maybe don't do it during mealtime, but um, for those of you with 
queasy stomach, but it's a good thing to look up if you haven't seen it in person. So uh, I run the uh, Sitton and Solid Waste District's Organics Recycling Facility. It is the home of Green Mountain Compost. We are uh, one of the larger composts in our region, but still pretty small scale compared to a lot of bigger commercial composting facilities in the country. Uh, this is a shot of our facility. We've been here since 2011, uh, after about 25 years in Burlington, Vermont, but we serve Chittenden County, Vermont, which is in the Champlain Valley, um, near UVM, where Joseph is located generally, uh, just to the east of Lake Champlain. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar, it's we're kind of in a population density area. However, we're surrounded by the Green Mountains and have lots and lots of forests, which are very important for Vermont's um, economy, as well as just the beauty and recreation that many of us Vermonters rely on and enjoy. And so, well, one other note is that when we're talking about sugaring in Vermont, that the first is maple syrup. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that process, we rely on intact forests full of sugar maples that we can go tap sap from and produce uh, that product that our state is perhaps most known for. So that's what we're looking to protect in all of this. Home gardens also do agree to a degree, but really, from my perspective, the preservation of the forest that we hold so dear uh, being threatened is what makes me worry the most. So we take on about 15,000 tons of food waste. So one, one other note is that I noticed that there are quite a few of you who are composters, that's great. I don't know, we should have asked a follow-up question to see how many of you are commercial composters versus other scales of composter. I'm guessing there's a few commercial composters out there. Looks like most of you are from the East and that most of you were already familiar with jumping worms have seen them and likely have them. Um, so less awesome on that piece. But um, hopefully this will be uh, relevant to many of you, uh, even if you are composting on the home scale. Um, because we do the same thing. We just do it in with lots of volume. So most of what we do is we take on food waste. Uh, and mix it with yard waste. Um, this is a windrow turner that will feature heavily uh, in our facility along the way, but it is basically taking on uh, all of our initial inputs and blending them before we start our aeration process. We do composting via aerated static pile composting, ASP is, is the method uh, Joseph referred to earlier. Um, and it's basically, unlike a home vector compost, uh, we are physically forcing air through the fresh batches of compost, uh, enabling the bacteria that are doing the majority of that degradation on the early stage of composting to have as much oxygen as they can possibly get so that they really uh, take off and or do some efficient composting. We do it in these concrete bays um, and everything is very controlled. We get uh, our fresh ingredients mixed up and then get to really high temperatures generally within a day, sometimes two days if it's really cold out. Uh, but we're going from ambient temperature to at least 130 or 40 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit um, within a very short period of time. And so um, this is another view of a secondary aeration phase that we do. Uh, again, it's on concrete where we've got lots of delicious looking material there if you are a worm, uh, particularly a jumping worm, uh, but receiving really high temperatures really quickly. Um, after approximately uh, five-ish weeks of composting with uh, intense aeration, we then transfer our materials to windrows, which is a very common form of composting in other facilities that may not have the aeration on the front end. Um, and here's where you can run into problems where if you have jumping worms present nearby, uh, the, this form of pile tends to, if it's early enough on, uh, if it's early enough in its composting phase, is producing lots of heat still, and particularly in the middle of the pile, but as the outer seconds of the pile are exposed to the atmosphere, uh, tends to cool off and therefore uh, it would be a perfectly suitable um, habitat for jumping worm that happen to be in the neighborhood. So we make those windrows, we then uh, aggressively turn them with the same, that's the same uh, window turner, uh, which acts basically like a um, tiller, uh, or it, it's 
this straddles the row that inverts the, the pile so that that hot material comes to the outside, the cold material on the outside goes to the inside, and for our purposes, main purposes, we're oxygenating uh, the bacteria still trying to accelerate the composting process. So that process takes us two to three months generally after the aeration phase, at which point we're calling our product finished. You can see those steaming piles in the foreground. Uh, we then pick up that material after it's, the temperatures have decreased substantially and it's ready for sale after we put it through one of our um, mechanical screeners. So that's that long conveyor belt is discharging the final uh, high quality fines that we sell as compost, in which you might be familiar with familiar with as a consumer. Um, so that then leaves our site uh, generally in large trucks uh, and goes to a variety of resellers. We depend on a network of uh, garden centers and uh, landscapers in our region to distribute our product. Um, we produce roughly 20,000 cubic yards of material uh, per year. This truck here is probably taking 30 or 40 cubic yards. So a lot a lot of those every year um, and the reason we're talking about compost uh, is you know, let's go back here for a sec is that compost is known as a way that jumping worms can spread um, and it makes a lot of sense knowing what we know about uh, their preferences and their biology that uh, particularly in instances where you're not getting the high temperatures it's a perfect it's a perfect uh, environment for them to live. Um, we think that if done well, composting doesn't have to be a point of transmission. Um, we try to achieve that, but there are many instances where composting likely is a point of transmission uh, be for a number of factors, and we'll get into those in a moment. Um, I just wanted to underscore, though, that even if you're doing a great job producing your compost, uh, once it leaves your facility, generally all control is lost, and um, we fear we've never seen jumping worms in our finished products, um, but do uh, appreciate that because we do sell our product to a lot of other outlets, um, including outlets like garden centers, which are uh, working in the uh, plant and horticulture trades, we know that there's a very good chance that uh, jumping worms are moving into our product once they reach another site. And so it's a conundrum. Um, unfortunately, we don't have representation from garden centers today, and uh, we have had some challenges trying to get their uh, participation when we've talked about this topic in the past for perhaps obvious reasons. Potted plants, uh, from our experience in this region, are probably one of the biggest vectors of jumping worms. Um, plants that are purchased at a nursery or from, from a plant sale, uh, plants that are given from one uh, household to another, as often happens, um, friend from friend to friend to family members, whatever it is. Uh, and then in addition, the nursery trades who also sell mulch products, wood products, and compost, um, our experience is that they are rife with jumping worms in our region, and uh, it makes our efforts, sometimes we, we're still trying to do the right thing, but we question about the effectiveness. So back to composting, what we can do, we rely on some really great humans to do much of the work, but in addition to the human team and the team of bacteria, the billions of bacteria that are at work, we depend heavily on some very large um, equipment. Some we have three front end loaders, uh, multiple wheeled vehicle trucks, and the windrow turner, uh, as well as a couple of screeners going most days of the week. And controlling for something that moves around that is perhaps you know inches long and can move quite great lengths and great distances and uh, with vigor, uh, and perhaps more importantly, then lay huge quantities of eggs and cocoons that can survive multiple years. We understand three or four years sometimes before hatching. Um, it's a big problem. So this is how, well, this is probably our most, uh, our greatest area of susceptibility for incoming jumping worms at our facility and probably similar to most other compost facilities. We accept yard waste, uh, which often includes leaves, 
collected from lawns, grass clippings, garden trimmings, um, as well as woody debris. Um, and it is collected from all over our county. Uh, homeowners, landscapers are coming in every day, seasonally in greater numbers, but coming in and dropping off. And we have never, uh, never seen actual jumping worms in the incoming material, but that's probably because we're not looking. We receive upwards of 5,000 tons of this every year, and there would just be no way of screening at all. And at this point, based on what we've heard from members of our community uh, who have been looking in gardens all over Chittenden County and beyond, we know that they are everywhere. And they are, it's, it's a given at this point that this material that we're seeing coming in every day is, if not um, rife with adult and juvenile worms, that it does have cocoons with it. So we are highly reliant on our high temperatures to take care of that, plus uh, some other important features of our site. So if we go back to our layout, um, we have, we're stretched out over approximately 13 acres. It's not all on this screenshot here, but um, from one end of our site to the other is uh, almost a half a mile, uh, which we used to complain about, but in the context of jumping worms might be actually beneficial. Uh, the reason being that most of our um, receiving of material, the problematic material, the yard waste um, specifically, as well as our high temperature early stage composting is all concentrated on one end of the facility um, and is quite a distance from our final product. So uh, this is the closer shot shows those areas where the um, area on the top right is our aerated static piles where we're getting up to very high temperatures for weeks and weeks on end um, and doing aggressive turning in between stages there. Um, right below that, um, beyond two big concrete walls, is where we receive our yard waste. And so um, our residential traffic and landscapers come in from off screen on the right there. They drop material. Um, they go on and have a great day and happy to get rid of their material as well as whatever's living in it. We then pick up that material and make our fresh batches um, before it completes that cycle, the early process, and then goes further down. Uh, let's see, and then it goes down our long wine to Pudis Road to our windrows for two to three weeks, sorry, two to three months of curing. Uh, over which time the product does cool off, but we are turning aggressively. And then the screening and outloading of finished products happening at the far end of the facility. Um, so our next biggest line of defense uh, beyond the separation of um, components of the facility in terms of incoming and outgoing material, maturing material is our ability, the fact that we have so much equipment and our ability to actually change and be very proactive and thoughtful about which equipment we're using for different functions on the site. So this is a staged photo. We usually don't have all three buckets for this machine right next to each other, but this machine is the one that we use for the front end of our process, and it does use regularly, most days, uses all three of these buckets. And one of those buckets we call the dirty bucket, and uh, it is only use, only allowed to be used for receiving, picking up the receiving materials, so the yard waste as it comes in, incorporating it into our fresh batches, um, and then basically everything that happens before our high temperature process uh, has met its required um, duration, which for those of you who aren't as familiar with commercial composting for an area static pile, we have to get by law, by regulation, up to uh, 131 degrees Fahrenheit or 55 degrees Celsius for a minimum of three days. We stretch that out and get to that temperature for, for many weeks. Um, and after that temperature uh, threshold, we presume that we've killed off not only, you know, probably within hours, we've killed off all the adults and juveniles, uh, but also the cocoons uh, probably within a day or two. I forget what that duration is. Um, and then we have many more weeks of high temperatures and some um, moving of the piles that would uh, probably get whatever is missed in the early stages 
if that were to occur. Then we switch buckets. So when that material gets moved to a different area, uh, of course, it's, it's, uh, its primary screening is, is being done with uh, for other large buckets. Uh, another step we take that most compost facilities, or you know, unless you're a large compost facility, you might not have the ability to do, but this is a picture of our operator norm, taking a, a high pressure, high temperature uh, washer, steam cleaner uh, to our windrow turner. So are we use a windrow turner in multiple pieces of our operation from the very front end, mixing the incoming materials uh, to the very back end? We, do we use it for that windrow turning that I described earlier, but then we also use it to blend our finished products at the tail end of the process. And you can imagine if we were going straight from incoming yard waste to finished product without taking this step, we could be running into some problems with um, the presumed quantity of cocoons and uh, worms even that might travel along with that uh, machine. So. Every time we are done with that initial stage, we do take the time to wash up the machine as thoroughly as possible with this uh, high pressure, uh, high temperature um, washer steamer. It does reach uh, over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, but I think, which is you know, probably would kill an adult, uh, but probably the pressure, the high pressure is doing more of the cleaning and uh, protective features rather than the high temperatures. But it is handy in the winter when uh, we are trying to. Uh, get equipment moving in cold, frozen environments. So uh, I'm, I'll be wrapping up on the compost bit real quickly here, but I wanted to just point out why why bother. Um, so we don't we don't have great data about how far and wide spread this jumping worm issue is. Um, this screenshot is from iNaturalist, which um, is one of the citizen science apps available that is used heavily in certain areas and not at all people most people don't know about it uh, and this is just uh, looking at uh, jumping worms as a group where their distribution through this citizen science app it's not perfect it's not uh, reviewed perhaps but it gives us one of our best ideas of where they are unfortunately and i, I did a close-up of vermont on the subsequent slide this is northern vermont here and uh, if you can see the word Williston there, just to the east of Burlington, which is to the east of Lake Champlain, uh, that is where we are located. And you can see we are surrounded by a smattering of red spots, which indicate that somebody on their app said, I have jumping worms, or I think I have jumping worms. Um, and if you looked at that picture, maybe you wouldn't be too concerned, either the national or the up close um, Vermont version. However, I think, unfortunately, in because we are lacking, because this is we're newly researching this, we don't have a great picture of where they are. Uh, we're dependent instead on anecdote from uh, garden centers and other people in our region. And I can tell you, having talked to lots of people in our region, if we had a true representation of what the distribution were, this map would likely be more red than green um, in our county, which is you know the center of the what's shown on the map there. So it's. They are everywhere, and at this point, again, my biggest concern is not that they are affecting people's home gardens so much, uh, although that can be destructive and makes it harder to sell a compost that somebody wants to put in their garden. Uh, more, more concerning is that what happens to those worms as they exit the garden, either through travel or more likely, you know, travel of their own means or more likely somebody removing plant matter or soil matter and putting it uh, elsewhere on their property or in the garden, or sorry, on the forest line. Because a lot of Vermonters, unlike uh, many parts of the country, uh, live, though even the ones that live in urban areas, might they have, there's a lot of trees around. And a lot of us have um, properties that end on a forest line, and it's common practice to remove plant matter to go then into the forest. And, um, anecdotally, we are hearing that even in our pristine forests that are within 30, 40 minutes, that they are, they are showing up in forests, and it's a matter of time before our maple industry is going to be in trouble, perhaps. So that's why we care, and that's why we're trying to do our part. Again, we struggle about how, how much it matters, but uh, we'll continue to put up a good fight and 
thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer questions uh, if we have time. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Um, for the in the interest of time, I'm going to wait uh, to ask more questions at the very end. But that was an amazing presentation. Um, but now we're going to hand things over to Natasha, our final presenter. Um, Natasha Duarte is the director of the Composting Association of Vermont, uh, and she leads CAV's policy and education initiatives and promotes the production and use of compost and has extensive experience working with rural and small communities. So Natasha, let's let's get after it. All right, thank you. Um, I had my presentation up and somehow it, when I shared my screen, it went away. So let me just uh, let me just try that again. All right, whoops, keeps jumping out. Can you see that? No, it disappeared. Uh, but just let us know if you'd prefer us to open up the presentation and progress yeah. for you. Yeah, why what don't you go ahead, me? just because I know um, we're on time and it brings it up, but then um, but then disappears immediately. So I'm not sure exactly what that's about, but if you have it, that link handy, that'd be great. Sorry about that. No worries. That's why we do this backup thing. Right, Thanks for seeing us. Yep. Yes. Um, if you could put it in. Present. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Excellent. Thank you all. Um, and you can go ahead to the, yeah, that next slide is fine. Um, so I'm going to be talking about strategies for, um, we're sort of like, you have this overview of jumping worms from, from Joseph and then this commercial sort of compost setting from Dan. I'm going to be talking about strategies that, um, that that I've been working with folks on at the community and farm level. So we're going to get really pragmatic here, um, and I'm going to share some of the things that I've been seeing and some of the the strategies that we're employing, and then um, and then hopefully we'll still have some good time for for Q and A. So what to do? You've now heard this uh, potentially startling news about jumping worms and where they are and it can feel overwhelming um, and so i think the first thing to really think about is like do you have them on your site if you do have them try to knock back the population we've already heard that it's you know can be challenging to think like we're going to totally eradicate them but the goal is and i do think it's worthwhile from what i've seen um, to, to knock back the populations and then really try not to share the, the worm love and if you don't have them, uh, I'll review some steps for for trying to prevent getting them. And then we're gonna I'm gonna touch on just a few tips for folks like myself who support community and on farm composting, things that we can do. And then um, uh, I'll just be ending with some uh, echoing a little bit of what Dan said about the outreach and education and, and Joseph as well. Next slide. All right, so knowing if you have them. So if it's not obvious, like if you're like, like oh, this is a problem, um, you can spot check with a mustard flush. Um, and that's basically mixing um, ground hot yellow mustard seed with water and then poorly sl slowly pouring it over a sort of like a, you're gonna spot test different parts of your property in soil and this will irritates the worms and drives them to the surface. And then, um, but it doesn't kill them. And so then you need to remove them, document it, report it. Those are parts, pieces that we're, we're really encouraging folks to do. And then avoid sharing, you know, if you know that you have them, again, avoid sharing plants and soil um, or, or compost potentially. And so in this picture, um, you know, this is a student doing a study. And so they have this nice um, little square foot frame um, but don't get too caught up in those details if you're doing this. You know, you know about what a square foot is. Um, so I am often working with um, folks who who are really trying to do it exactly right, and it's really more just like spot check your property and see if there's a problem. Next slide. Um, so positive identification, and we've heard. Um, you know about this and Joseph touched on it and there was a question about it already. How do you know if they're really um, jumping worms, if they're these, these invasive worms? 
Um, this I find is most important if you're holding on to the idea that earthworms are good. They're a symbol of soil health, and you only want to eradicate, you know, to, to remove um, or, or get rid of the these jumping worms. Um, but I see a lot of people get caught on on this, like I don't know, and so they do nothing, and they do have these jumping worms that are more destructive than other earthworms um potentially and so um and so i encourage folks like when in doubt pluck them out so for for many of us um these you know the earthworms that we see are invasive they are not native worms in our landscape and so i you know i really encourage folks to not get too hung up on positive identification um, i do think taking pictures of what you find and getting them to someone like Joseph can be helpful um, just in terms of documenting things, but don't give the worms the benefit of the doubt. If you're not sure and you think they might be jumping worms, the best course of action is to really just remove them if you can. Next slide. So reducing the population, um, and I phrase it this way because again, you know, if your goal and if you're going to be disappointed if you don't, you know, like put, put some work in and then you have none, what we're learning is that may not be so realistic, perhaps over time, but certainly not from month to month or year to year. So the two main ways that you can reduce population are um, physical removal, and then um, and then there are some other methods that I'll I'll get to. So physical remover removal is like you're actually just taking the worms and killing them. So taking the worms, bucking them off your site. Um, a lot of the folks that I interact with do this on like a plot by plot or a greenhouse by greenhouse. Um, setting so you can kind of work around. I, I joke with some folks that what we need is like a, a a band of community worm gleaners. So instead of gleaning the the leftover produce, some of you might be familiar with gleaning programs, but some some community effort to actually rem physically remove the the worms from infected areas. Once you remove them, you can smush them. You can put them in a bucket of soapy water. They'll get stuck there and drown. I, I am increasingly um, talking with folks who are choosing to use vinegar water. Um, so, so part of that is, you know, some people have a harder time just squashing or, you know, letting worms drown, and the vinegar water will kill them more quickly. Um, from what I've seen, and, and uh, uh, perhaps Joseph knows more, but I've seen uh, people report that vinegar water does kill cocoons and that it doesn't always kill cocoons. So that's something to work out for those the little eggs. Um, but it is, and you don't want to apply the vinegar water directly on plants or in your garden or on your farm because that will kill um, you know, the vegetation as well. But if you have a bucket of it, that should be fine. And then there are other folks who just, you know, carry like a Ziploc bag, um, plastic bag, and collect up the worms as they find them, and then seal it up and and put it in the and landfill it essentially, put it in their trash. Um, sometimes leaving it out in the sun first, but uh, so those are uh, some different options for physical removal. Other methods we've heard from. Uh, Dan, you know, hot composting certainly will get hot enough to kill them, um, even the cocoons. Just remember that this is reducing the population, though, because it, depending on your compost system, and, um, and especially if you're not a commercial composter and have a little less uh, controls over the system, perhaps, there you may not be getting all of that material up to temperature to kill the the worms and cocoons and so that's why turning and your material in is is good anyway for weed seeds and pfrp and uh, killing pathogens and and other reasons but just remember that you may not get all of them but you are i think making a a, a very reasonable and measurable dent in the populations um just to iterate that this is a learning process we, you know uh, linda started this webinar talking about the, a panel that we had in May at the Vermont Organics Recycling Summit. And I was feeling really hopeful about solarization, but it, 
it's what I'm, I'm really learning is that that's really less practical than we hoped it would be. Um, it, it's hard, you know, the temperatures need to stay, you know, hot for three days, it cools down at night, it, you just can't, you know, they can escape. Um, gra the ground is cooler than the air. So th there are some challenges around solarization. One of the farmers I worked with who was having a real problem with, um, with jumping worms, steam sterilized his, uh, the soil in all of his greenhouses. Um, it was pretty expensive. It took a week for him to, to, to steam. He had to rent the, the steamer and then it took him about a week to, to steam all of his, I think he has seven greenhouses. Um, so there's time and, and other resources is, that are going into that. And I really thought that, you know, that would be a temporary fix, but it's been, he did that in May, I think it was end of May maybe. Um, and they really haven't come back meaningfully. I mean, there's a few, but like 90% still not, not back and, and much more feasible. And he's gotten much better growth. Um, he feels that the soil is recovering and, and his yields are recovering in those greenhouses. So that is um, another possibility that seems promising from, from what I've seen and what I've heard. Um, and then I also connect with a number of folks who are trying the tea seed meal. Um, and I, you know, anecdotally, I, I think the, you know, some, some folks have said that they've seen significant reductions and others don't seem to think it's made that much of a difference. But again, these haven't been done in, uh, you know, these are field experiments, I guess, and not maybe not even set up as a real experiment. And so we don't really know I don't really know from the people that I am, am connecting to, you know, are they using it at the same rate? Is it the same type of meal? How, you know, what are they growing on it? What was the population before and after? And so there's a lot of these unknowns still, which point to needing just more information and more data. Next slide. Um, so preventing the spread, um, if you have them uh, or if you don't want to get them and bring them to, to your property if you don't have them yet, bare root exchanges are the best. Um, washing the roots of plants, whether it's purchased or from a plant swap, um, you can use your mustard flush again to, to pour over these roots to see if any worms pop out. Um, you can see something like this, like a really pop bound plant will be a lot harder. To, to make sure that that's not infected than something that's pulled from the ground um, and is a little bit looser to be, you know, coming from loose dirt and looser to begin with. Um, but you still need to make sure that you're not, you know, I would say clean them and, and inspect them to make sure you're not um, getting, you know, as much as possible cocoons in there. And then growing plants from seed is, is, is becoming more and more uh, a viable option, I think. Next slide. So clean carbon is key. That's my alliteration for the day. Um, both Joseph and, and Dan have talked about that. Um, I, a number of the farmers I work with are choosing, who don't have jumping worms yet, are choosing to not bring any offsite feedstock. So they're not, you know, this is a, a picture of an old stump dump is what we call them. Um, so, you know, often communities will have some version of this where they can, going for free, get, uh, you know, various woody material or have um, some other folks have landscapers drop off leaves. And they're not doing that uh, just to try to, to limit a potential vector for being infected with the worms. And then checking feedstock sources. So having these conversations, even if you, um, even if you are bringing stuff from, from offsite, asking the question about jumping worm going to look at where it's coming from inspecting it before it's delivered to your site. These are all uh, strategies for trying to prevent getting them on your site if you don't have them. And, and we already touched on um, vermicomposting and red wigglers a little bit. Joseph addressed that um, well. And I, I would just say for vermicomposters, know your worms, source them from reputable dealers if you're starting out or if you're getting them. And if you're not sure, because I have um, heard of some people who did mail order and got them and ended up a num you know a large I don't know about a large but about 15% of what they received were jumping worms 
Um, uh, like if you're not sure, you're just going to need to, to, you know, either figure it out, have someone like Joseph or, or someone who's, who can really identify, come and help you or get rid of them and not by releasing them outside or, or giving them to your neighbor, but by killing them. Um, and that's unfortunate. And I think that there is still a place for vermicomposting and we just need to up our game a little bit and make sure that we're doing it responsibly. Um, next slide. So tools, Dan touched on this um, uh, already with his, uh, with Green Mountain Compost and how they're managing it at a commercial facility or municipal facility. Um, so if at all, you know, if possible, clean compost, soil, debris, whatever that, you know, organic matter is from vehicles, from personal gear, equipment, tools, um, have a dedicated pair of shoes for infected areas or clean them in between. Um, and I and I say and shoes in the in the heading of this slide because um, some folks who had jumping worms in one area were trying to be really careful and they didn't have them in a, in an upper field and and then they started showing up in the upper field and they had totally forgotten about cleaning their boots and had been walking through the infected areas and very likely getting cocoons um, or even potentially juveniles in you know stuck in the tread of their boots and then we're actually tracking them and carrying them and, and transplanting them into uninfected parts of their property and so uh, just remember um, you know try to think of all the places that you're coming into contact all the different gear that's coming into contact with uh, potentially uh, with with jumping worms next slide So um, for organizations um, like the Composting Association of Vermont, like myself or, or others um, who work with community and on-farm composters, really the, the best thing I can recommend is that you start talking about jumping worms to the people you work with if you haven't been already. Um, you wanna be cleaning your tools between sites and either cleaning your shoes or changing your shoes um, if you're working at some sites that have jumping worms and others that don't, you don't want to be the become the vector. Uh, and remember, don't bring them home, right? So um, I was just yesterday at a farm that had a lot of jumping worms, and when I came home, I, you know, took my shoes off and actually changed them before I got in my car, put them in a plastic bag, and then when I got home, I set them in a boot tray filled with vinegar water um, to just make sure that. I didn't have time to just really clean them off right then and there, but I wanted to make sure that I was addressing anything that I may have brought home because I personally don't have them on my property yet. And I'm, I'm really trying hard to keep it that way. Uh, next slide. So knowledge is power. Um, the Composting Association of Vermont did put together, um, working with Joseph and Dan and others, um, some recommended questions. This is more for 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 just you know homeowners or uh, community people who who may not be composting or farming. So um, we listed have lists of questions to that people can ask their compost facilities, their landscapers, or their garden centers to make sure that you know to see if they have best management practices in place. Are they aware of jumping worms? What you know, how are they approaching this? And then um, I've been uh, recently, a lot of people have been asking me to create the same for feedstock sources. So if you are a community or on-farm composter, what can you be asking and how do you frame it for people that you might be getting feedstock from? So that whether it's that carbon material or manures or bedded pack or whatever it is, bringing it onto your site. And so I'm, I'm gonna be working on, on that. Um, this coming fall. So we'll be adding to that. And that's at compostingvermont.org slash jumping worms. And next slide, which I think is my last. So I just, you've heard this from uh, all of us, but I'm gonna say it again. Um, there's really a need for more community science. So while a lot of this can be overwhelming, um, we need to figure out collectively how to empower people to get engaged, uh, encourage people to report their findings, and identify barriers and find workarounds. I think that's something that um, this community can really help with. And so uh, Dan put up iNaturalist. It was funny, I was thinking of doing the same and didn't have time, but 
Um, so you've seen that sort of citizen science, community science in, uh, interactive map where people can report their findings. Um, different states have different versions of that um, where, you know, so we can see the, the extent of a problem for all kinds of invasive species, including the jumping worms. But those tools aren't really intuitive for everybody and um, they're not necessarily accessible. So, you know, it might just downloading and creating an account and figuring out how to use it and how do you upload it and where and all of that can be enough of a barrier that people won't engage with those tools. I actually just last week started a conversation with the University of Vermont's um, uh, extension master composter master gardener program and I'm hoping to be working with those volunteers throughout the state to help gather some information and then those individuals can be point people within their communities to be uploading the data that they find into sites like iNaturalist to help begin better characterizing the extent of the problem. Um, and I'll just echo what Dan said, like we need to show the extent of the problem to get more resources directed to both research and solutions. And so we need to, you know, we need to know not only from um, like a, like a, you know, sort of a lab setting or more official research setting that, you know, we definitely need more uh, resources directed there, but we also really need these community science experiments and folks who are trained to help set up things. So we know this level of team meal works and this level may not be enough or this might be overkill. So we can start really teasing apart what are the options that we have to address this issue. And um, and that's what I will leave my presentation on. Hopefully that's a, a, a clear call to action and something that people feel like they can can start to wrap their heads around and, and get engaged in addressing jumping worms. Wonderful, thank you, Natasha. That was a great um, wrap up for the presentations. And I know we're uh, a little tight, but I'm hoping we could address uh, at least a couple of questions. So if Joseph and Dan, um, you're willing to put yourselves back on video, um, let's get into some of these questions. So considering how many, the a majority of the people on are consider themselves composters. I just want to make sure that we're hitting home, like what to do if you have um, jumping worms in your compost and you you either know you do or you're you suspect that you do. What are your options for treating your compost? Are and physical removal may not be likely. What is are we looking at vinegar? Are we looking at detergent treatment of the compost? Um, and yeah, I don't know. I would love to hear your thoughts. It probably depends on if you're talking home scale, backyard compost. I assume, like if you're a big commercial facility, it'd be really hard to do something to all of your compost, other than what you're already naturally doing, which is high heat, likely, and physical um, aggravation. Uh, I would say for the backyard composter, don't give it to somebody else would be part one um, because that's how they're going to spread. And then, uh, man, I don't know, Joseph, what do you think or Natasha about like if you have a backyard pile full of worms? Uh, very difficult, right? So, um, I mean, I, I oftentimes say, uh, you know, solarize, but it is a lot of work. I mean, you have to shift stuff from one place to another and uh, and then set up the experiment set up the experiment or the, your solarization package uh, and then leave that in place for three days but it is a lot of work um, i don't think that adding vinegar is the answer necessarily <laughs> you would depending on the size of your compost pile you know mine is about a cubic yard and uh maybe i can get away with putting putting vinegar through that, but you would need a lot of vinegar. So even for a, for, for one of those bins that is about a yard in size. Uh, and then if you have a slightly bigger uh, compost pile and maybe in the back of your yard, uh, I'd say um, really difficult. Uh, again, you know, sterilization might work, but you have to move the stuff and repackage it. And uh, that's that's a lot of work. Uh, what I can say is, if you if you have 
these worms in your compost pile and the compost pile is, is right adjacent to a forest, you may want to move that compost pile somewhere else if you don't want to, um, if you don't want to have that forest be, uh, be infect, uh, infected by, invaded by these worms. I mean, they move around anyway. I mean, that's the, that's the problem. They move, they move with people. So that, you know, the boots that, cleaning your boots is, is one thing, cleaning equipment is another. Right, so Dan and, and Natasha were mentioning mentioning these those tech th those things, um, but water is is yet another thing. So if you have a really good rainfall, like you get a couple of inches, uh, then most most likely those worms are moving with the water downhill, and uh, yeah, I, I really don't know a good answer for for the homeowner. I mean, keeping it on keeping the compost on on site is important. Uh, but how do you prevent the worms from moving? Uh, yeah, I'll just add that I I've talked to a couple of people who had um, and you're not going to get all of them, and you're not going to get the cocoons. But they they built basically a, a screen like you would use for your compost anyway, and put it wow. over. But they used like eighth inch, you know, they they used a finer screen, eighth inch, I think, and put mm -hmm. it over their wheelbarrow. And if you are a homeowner, you know, they basically they had worms, they knew it they just basically pitchforked it over a wheelbarrow and got hundreds of worms captured and at least removed those from the picture yeah. and killed those. And so that gets back to what I was saying about knocking back the population and that if you do that and then you do it again and you do it again, I think over time it, it you know, it's, I think it's better than doing nothing. Absolutely, I agree. So the the uh, the trick is to remember that each one of those worms can produce sixty cocoons, of which maybe uh, eighty percent will hatch in the long run. So you you're moving something like fifty uh, fifty. Well, every every time you remove a worm, you're removing fifty fifty cocoons as well. You know, future cocoons. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I was, I don't know that I was clear in my question, but I was aiming that at the smaller end of the spectrum where getting compost to temperature may be a bit of, more of a challenge. So thank you for addressing that. And if you all are okay with me asking a couple more questions, I know we're a little bit over time, uh, but it's such a, there's lots of questions coming in. So it's exciting. Um, and I wanna take advantage of this wonderful opportunity. Um, there were a number of questions that came in about defending sort of the curing area of a composting uh site and i just want to kind of reiterate i know we heard you know making sure you have clean shoes clean tools um and making sure that what's gone into your curing pile is not contaminated to begin with but any other final thoughts on on that yeah physical separation i think is the biggest one being if, if you can make your your finished product your final product uphill from your other one maybe that's important for the rain event that joseph was describing um i think having in an ideal scenario for a, a commercial composter you have it on a hardened surface that is not going to be easily transversible uh, by a worm they don't they don't even really like going across lawns if they're i understand that if there's if there's good food source in one spot they're not going to then go 100 yards to find a forest, for instance. And similarly, on a compost site, if you've got stone surface in between stone or asphalt or whatever it is, they're likely not going to choose that if they've got plenty of food where they are. So physical distance, I think, is the best. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, one thing I'll mention that, and Dan, you kind of alluded to this, and I, I didn't have it on my slide because I've just been learning about it and hearing about it, but I'm also connecting with a, a couple farmers who have real problems are um, are what they call uh, jumping worm baiting. And so they're like creating essentially a section where they are, you know, this nice organic rich material and trying to attract the worms to, to that spot and then having their cure pile and other things away from it. And um, and then doing sort of what I was saying, then it's like a more concentrated area and a little bit less overwhelming to try to physically remove as many adult worms as they can. I just don't know how successful the the baiting strategy is, Joseph. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Well, this uh, I, I was a few years back. I was in Turkey, and uh, they were in, in Turkey. Uh, 
red wigglers are expensive. There's a, a ton of people that want to do vermicomposting there. Uh, there was this boom there and, and each worm was like 10 cents, you know, so you want to buy a million, a million uh, worms for your for your verm new vermicomposting uh, facility, you had to invest. And so the people that were producing these worms had them in in these big raised bed, not raised beds, there, there were these, yeah, these beds that were raised off the ground. Um, and uh, worms do escape from, from all sorts of places. And uh, the way they, they caught them was with bait and they used cantaloupe melons, <laughs> expensive way to do it here, but in Turkey, they were dirt cheap. Uh, and certainly worth their while. So there, there are certain things that will attract them. Uh, melons are probably some other uh, food waste that that uh, that you might have. Maybe uh, can can be used as bait. Um, yeah, and that, chickens I think... also love them. So that's another thing to like for folks who have chickens, whether it's a backyard flock or as part of an integrated into a, a compost system, a, a larger yep. compost system. Um, that's a you know there are some other ways to get animals to do the physical removal for you yes there there are a few places that that do that even in in the composting in the big composting world so chicken chicken are good great um and are there any other known predators to the jumping worm uh other birds um uh they have been even hawks have been seen with them in their in their beaks. Um, uh, some salamanders and some snakes, uh, voles, as well. But uh, they're just not they're just not eating enough of them. Basically, <laughs> they're not they're not right. lowering the. You're a better predator than than a snake is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and some people were commenting that some of the methods that control methods that were being talked about might be more effective for the grow, uh, adult worms, maybe not getting the cocoons, but like the point is that we're trying to reduce population that if you get the adult worms, you're preventing future cocoons from hatching or being for, created, correct? So. Actually, actually, I would say if you, if you can identify, well, I mean, as Natasha said, you know, you might not want to identify and un, un, identify the worms uh, to, to jumping worms, right? Because uh, in, in the Northeast, um, uh, they're all invasive. However, if you are south of the last glaciation, so you're talking about maybe you know Georgia or or Virginia or uh, I don't know uh, Southern California or California, uh, Oregon, uh, you you have you have worms that are native, and you don't want to remove those. So you, you still have to come down in those states. You will still have to figure it out, figure out what what those what those worms are. But if you can find if you can figure out how to identify the juveniles, and this is by by looking at their behavior in your hand. If you poke them, they should thrash about like violently. Um, then, if you can remove those juveniles, then you're preventing them from becoming adults altogether. So, any kind of any kind of thing you can do with mustard, uh, or I mean, must, mustard or any other kind of treatment, try and do this during the time um, that they're not adults. So, you're talking about uh, until mid June, uh, beginning of July. Those are those are your your dates in which you should get the the juveniles. Wonderful. Uh, thank thank you for that clarification. So two final questions to try to wrap things up here. Um, somebody posted um, that they had heard or when they were doing research themselves found that uh, fishermen actually specifically like these types of worms and that they were being sold for this explicit purpose. Um, that is that still happening despite this being a problematic <laughs> expansion of jumping worms in the in the U.S. Well, I so the problematic expansion is is by by those uh, internet outlets, right? And th that there's one that I usually quote enough time to do today, but quote I quote them and they say uh, they have on their website they have a disclaimer. And it says, oh. There is a controversy about these worms. You know, there pe some people say that, uh, but you are the judge of that yourself. You know, don't believe other people. Make up your own mind about whether you whether you believe it or not. And if you do, and, and then I mean that that dis disclaimer is there for them to protect themselves, maybe. But it's also kind of kind of putting something into people's ears, where it doesn't. It, 
just some people said that, so it doesn't mean it's true, right? So, uh, so the, the internet outlets are the problem uh, because they, they will they will state, oh, this is good for fishing, this is good for for your soil, you know, uh, 100, 100 worms of these will turn your soil over and it's, it's better than, than, than plowing. They have all these claims that, that are either bogus or not, or not at least at least not researched well. And as, as far as fishing goes, a friend of mine uh, fishes and he, he tried it out with, uh, with jumping worms. And apparently, because they're under so much pressure, they kind, of, they kind of explode a little bit on you because there's so much pressure in them. That's what makes them look so strong and allows them to flip around. That uh, maybe they're not all that great for fishing. <laughs> um, yeah, so the uh, earthworms can survive in the water, and it's probably not the worms that you that you pierce with a uh, with a hook that are the problem. It's the ones that get get away from 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 your tub, from your uh, worm tub, that are going to be the problem, right? So, um, and that that is how some of the European worms uh, spread with with. Uh, um, bait that's been discarded at the fishing site because people don't want them in their, their truck and, and dying in their truck because it stinks to high heaven. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, so much to think about. Uh, but to leave everybody on a positive note, I think you all have peppered these into your presentations, but just to kind of wrap it up with the ways that individuals can get involved, whether they are researchers, whether they are policy makers, whether they are composters, users of compost. Um, we've heard citizen science and getting in, involved there, helping to really get a sense of the breadth of, the, you know, the reach of uh, the um, jumping worm uh, area and, but anything else that you all wanna leave folks with at this point. Yeah, I'd like to say uh, get involved um, in this, either through iNaturalist or uh, I often say call your representatives and, and tell them, you know, there's a problem with these worms. Uh, make sure that that maybe uh, the regulatory agencies uh, becomes, I mean, I think in Vermont they're serious about it, but they don't know what to do. Uh, come come in, Become interested in maybe looking at emergency certifications of, of pesticides for these worms. I'll just add, I think we need it on both sides, right? We need movement for regulation and policy and, and more funding for research. And then we also need um, just a band of, of people on the ground trying things out and reporting back in a, in a you know, so we need, we need, I think there's a real role for organizations to play in helping connect like just the average person who's concerned and getting more involved in this and folks like Joseph or researchers or you know the Department of Ag, you know, invasive species groups or whatever. And so I think there's a real role to play um, for community organizations to, to help bridge those two and, and pull all the information together that we can. Yeah, if I can, if I can re uh, react to this quickly, um, we have a group of researchers now that that span from Nova Scotia all the way to Wisconsin, and we are we are trying to formalize that a little bit, and we're looking basically we're looking for uh, not only doing the research but also connecting all the stakeholders so that that this, these kinds of things can be can, can be addressed in, in the way that Natasha was mentioning. Everybody can be involved. There's there's organizations that are already really interested in this kind of work, and and being able to connect them through with the researchers and the regulators and the industry, pesticide industry uh, and the horticulture industry, the, the, the maple the sugar people uh, is really important because that's the only way that we can really uh, solve some of the problems that these worms are causing. So uh, stay, stay tuned, there'll be a web page sometime in December that will be up that will uh, describe what we are doing. Wonderful. That's a good thing to look forward to. Dan, any final thoughts from you? No, I think you hit them all. Uh, it, yeah, I think just getting more people aware. So talk about it with people you know, people in the industry, people not in the industry. I think uh, that will help. And yeah, just the, getting people to appreciate the potential impacts, um, not in their backyard, but in their state, in their region. Uh, it, 
it could be a game changer amongst many game changers. As was pointed out, we got a lot going on, a lot of things to worry about. We don't all really need another one, but this seems like an important one. Yeah, I mean, I think people should think about that, that these earthworms are not only, you know, annoying in the, in the yard, but they're also potentially uh, economic factor, right? So they, so for, for nurseries, it's uh, once people kind of cotton on to the fact that, that they're getting, that, that they're getting these worms from, from nurseries, uh, you know, that maybe people will just go for the seed and, the, and, and, uh, for the seed and and uh, um, sticking sticks in the ground to to uh, to grow things um, and not go to nursery. So that there's one, and the other one is that you know the for the maple sugar industry, the regeneration of of uh, sugar maple is is at risk, uh, and uh, that in the long run is also a, a, an issue, economic issue. So there's money involved as well as, you know, and that means likelihoods is uh, involved. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. And thank you all for staying on um, past our uh, 1.30 uh, end time, but great presentations, all of you. Um, and really just appreciate um, your ability to make this approachable and to give everyone really solid action items that they can start implementing themselves. So. Um, Joseph, Dan, and Natasha, thank you so much, and thank you to everyone who participated. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.